afternoon. Welcome to In Focus. I'm your host, Melissa Ridgen. Day school survivors were left to the sidelines to watch the federal government finally compensate those who were forced to attend residential schools. Of course, many uh, suffered the same abuses in day school, even if they got to go home at the end of the day. More than a decade after waiting, the residential, after the residential school compensation, uh, many Indian day school survivors can now apply for compensation. A $200 million fund is set up uh, to award between $10,000 and $200,000 to former students, but not all. Ottawa has deemed only half of the day schools that operated in Canada as being eligible for this settlement. The other half, they said, summer schools, uh, summer sanatoriums, and assortment of other facilities built to warehouse Indigenous children were run by churches, provinces, uh, or bands sometimes, and so therefore not really their problem, even though it was the government of Canada's own assimilation policies that set up this system that these facilities operated under. Today we're putting day school compensation in focus. We're going to break it down, uh, hopefully to make it a little more clear what options you have if you attended day school or in, were, were, were in one of the left out facilities. So we'll help you understand whether you're part of the government's compensation package, and if so, what you do, uh, and if not, what avenues are there for you. So uh, in a written statement, let's just go back to, we've got, uh, this is from Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett talking about the government settlement. This is an important step towards healing and justice for day school survivors and their families. This agreement demonstrates a comprehensive approach accomplished by working with survivors, which cannot be achieved through court processes. Then a little later in the show, we're going to talk to immigration partnership Winnipeg about a toolkit that they designed to build relationships between immigrant and Indigenous communities. It might be news to you or it might not, but there's oftentimes tension between these communities in many urban centres across Canada. Of course, we always want to hear from you too, so join in our conversation. Our phone lines are open. If you have any questions about how to get uh, in on the federal compensation or you're wondering about class action suits, we're going to try to help you. Call us toll-free, 1-877-647-2786. You can also tweet us at APTN in focus. So joining us now to get this whole uh, day school's compensation issue started, make sense of it, we've got Kathleen Martins, APTN's web reporter, award-winning journalist. She has covered extensively the residential school settlement, uh, day school settlement compensation. Uh, and we have Steve Cooper. He is the lawyer who's working on a class action lawsuit for day school survivors that were left out of the federal compensation package. Between these two, we hope that we can make things a little clearer for you. Because they're not even clear for me as we were preparing for this show. You know, I, so I even found numbers. the hoops, the hoops, the numbers, the uh, the lingo. I find too. You almost need to be a lawyer to understand the lingo, even if you go onto these government websites. Well, uh, trust me, there's lots of lawyers that, that, that don't <laughs> understand how this works either. There's always a, a tension between making things simple, but not making them so simple that they become unmanageable. And, and when you're drafting these types of agreements and managing these these sorts of settlements, there's always that sort of struggle. And, and that balance isn't always struck in these settlement agreements. No, it's so true. Kathleen, you've covered these ex things extensively. Like I said, going back to the residential school settlement, the process that they had to go through to be compensated, uh, and then the demand uh, for the day school survivors to be compensated, their fight to get that done, the government finally saying, okay, well, we'll deal with half of you guys. Yeah. Um, you know, tell us, just to kind of put people at ease, because I'm sure there's a lot of people watching going, I don't understand it, I don't get it. Can you put them at ease? You are, you've been a journalist for 30 years. You're an educated woman. Is this, are, should they feel bad for not understanding oh, no. this? Okay. No, they're all, we're all in the same boat okay. here. Oh yeah, no, it's, I mean, we, we often phone people like Steve, we, I am on speed dial, but uh, you know, and we'll, uh, we ourselves, you know, we get, we get stuff like this, right? Just pages and pages and pages of paper and documents and numbers and then we want to try to boil it down and make it as simple as possible and yeah. easy to understand because when it comes down to it it's just going to be you and your your paper claim form at home mm -hmm. and a pen and you have to read it and you have to fill it out and you have to talk you have to go back and remember Steve was saying this earlier today that um, a lot of this is well in the past for many of these claimants. So mm. they have to remember, you know, when they went to, to day school. Mm. Um, what, who, did they have any medical issues when they were there? Because um, everyone's going to get $10,000. Everyone who went to a day school will get what they call a common experience payment. Okay. And yeah, that's actually a misunderstanding. Oh, okay. Um, big difference between previous settlements and this settlement is that there's nothing automatic 
um, about the ten thousand dollar sort of base or level one compensation. Uh, okay. In every instance, even for the, the ten thousand dollars that we often characterize as a common experience or the general compensation payment, mm -hmm. has to be paid only on the basis of abuse. Now, it's a very low level of, uh. of abuse. It could be um, culturally inappropriate uh, punishments. It could be uh, discriminatory behavior. It could mm. be uh, comments about the color of one's skin or, or, or one's uh, culture or, or, or heritage. So this was an evolution. I don't know if it was a good evolution, mm. but it was an evolution from the mere attendance sort of compensation package that we've seen in, in similar settlements. Well, th thanks for clarifying that then. We're so all going to learn together here today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and, and then up to 200000 up to 200000 for the worst of the abuses. Okay. So th there, there's a $10,000 amount for the sort of entry level, I, I don't mean to, to denigrate from no. that, from the lower levels of abuse yeah. um, that were, were suffered by Indigenous students in particular, and then moving up into 50, 100, 150, and $200,000, depending on the nature and uh, how often the abuse took place. So this is, there is going to be uh, a re traumatizing element to this process. Is it going to be, because I remember, I didn't cover the residential school stuff, like Kathleen, that's why you're here. Uh, but, and I didn't cover it, but I remember just as a news consumer, hearing a lot about people you, having, what they had to go through to relive that trauma. Are we doing the same thing to day school survivors now? Yeah, there's certainly an element of re-traumatization because they have to remember what happened to them mm. and they have to write it on the form. And some to get grilled on it after? No, there's okay. no... The difference between this settlement and the residential school is here people are presumed to be truthful. That's big. That's big. So they don't have to go to a hearing like they did for residential school. They don't have to hire their own lawyer like they did for residential school. Mm. Um, and you but you still have to remember what happened and you have to write about it and then you're eligible for uh, compensation based on any of the any of those um, experiences that you had like let's say you were physically assaulted let's say you were sexually abused um, anything that led to a long-term injury it's also up to the plaintiffs to get their medical records uh, okay. so you you're doing some of the groundwork correct Yes, but in most mm. cases you won't need the records. Oh, okay. So as you move through the levels, you're, the, the level of, of proof or evidence is going to be a little bit more demanding. We learned from the residential school settlement, which was initially negotiated and signed off in 2005, but for which I still did a hearing, I think, in the last 12 months, if you can mm -hmm. believe it. Um, what is that, 14 or 15 or 16 years later. The hearings themselves were horrifically re-traumatizing, for many, but I'll tell you something, they were also um, releasing for many survivors, particularly of sexual abuse, it was often the first time that they had disclosed what had happened to anybody, uh, even family members. Right. Not everybody uh, experienced that sort of relief or release, but there was an upside to those hearings. The downside was that it was absolutely traumatic particularly before the hearing itself, just leading up to it. The yeah. anxiety. Exactly, totally. and, and having to remember and, and relive that. The other advantage, and, and I, I would never want to return to those days, was that people actually remembered more during the stress of the hearing uh -huh. and often opened doors that had been closed. And I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, but those closed doors were causing trauma um, sure. that, that wasn't recognized by, by the survivor. So we might want to say, correct Melissa then, if, if you had a good lawyer that led you through the process of remembering what happened to you, as you say, and helped you in your healing, you, you might have had a good experience with your residential school claim. Yeah. But if you were victimized by a um, bad lawyer, for lack of a different and word. And you know a lot of them. <laughs> then You've then uh, it made it worse. I just want to take a minute here. So this is good. Uh, we should share that there is um, uh, there's a crisis line. If you're watching this right now and you feel uh, that you're triggered by this, you can phone uh, 1-866-925-4419. That's not calling us. That is call It's a 24-hour uh, crisis line that's set up for residential school and day school survivors to help you. If you need to talk to somebody right now, just stop watching us and go and phone them. Sorry to cut you off, but no, we... That's, that's an important... It's really good you've got those numbers up because it's not easy stuff to talk about. No. Uh, we do have a caller, I understand, on the line. Tyson, who has a question about the forms. Tyson, are you there? 
No Tyson? Oh. Hey Tyson, Hi. how are you? Uh, pretty good. Good. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, uh, I'm just I'm just calling from my First Nation. That's Where are the you from? Office in uh, Kitsuan, Ontario. Oh, cool. So, uh, my question is, uh, what kind of resources are available to First Nation ban offices that are trying to help get resources for claimants to start uh, filling out the paperwork? Because I'm having a hard time trying to figure out what kind of resources are available for people that are not really able to call in or do a form themselves. So yeah. I was wondering what kind of resources available for First Steve. Nation offices to help their people fill out the forms. I, I'm honestly not aware of any resources that have been allocated for that specific purpose. Uh, my understanding is that the concept behind this process is that you would phone the 1-800 number and or go online and get the form. The uh, Gowlings, who was the law firm that negotiated this settlement, um, has been assigned the task uniquely mm -hmm. of assisting people in both answering questions of a legal nature and a process nature, yeah. but also to help fill out the forms. They're not filling forms, but rather they're providing support for that purpose. Right. There are, there are two phone numbers that are available online. One specifically is to a lawyer or a legal resource at Gowling's law firm. And yeah. secondly, to the claims administrator, I would certainly suggest that you start with the claims administrator, phone that number, and determine whether they can provide resources on behalf of your First yes. Nation. And thereafter, if any legal questions arise, um, in, in terms of which category or, or whether you are in fact entitled to anything or any of your members in the First mm -hmm. Nation, then call the, the, the lawyer line. Okay. I have, uh, there is a phone number that you can call, and I would encourage you to do this, Tyson, because they, they should be providing supports to the people who are supporting the day school survivors. So 1-888-221-2898. If you want to write that number down, Tyson, I'll give it to you again. It's 1-888-221-2898. Um, that's where I would take that, uh, that question for you. Also, I want to say, too, that we here at APTN, because we were trying to figure out, well, where, where do we get all this information? There's, there's not a one-stop shop for people to either find out if you are part of this government settlement, if your school is on a list um, that is part of the settlement, or if, not, if your school is a different school that might be eligible for the class action, which we're going to get into that in a little bit, too. But we have started up, um, we put up a website today and it has a whole bunch of resources on there for you, hopefully to make it a little easier for you to navigate. Uh, it's aptnnews.ca slash dayschools. Again, that's aptnnews.ca slash dayschools. We just put this website up. It's got a whole bunch of resources. Check that out too. Um, okay, I wanted to get into the, let's start, and I'll just throw this out to both of you. Mm -hmm. I don't know who wants to answer it. There's approximately 700 day schools that are eligible for federal comp compensation. And then there was another 700 schools or institutions or facilities that existed that are not part, part of that. Right. Can you explain, anybody explain why? I, I think <laughs> the, answer, why. the answer is found in the preamble to the settlement agreement. The settlement agreement is 270, 280 pages long, but most of that is uh, just support materials. The, the agreement itself is fairly readable. It's about 29 pages long. In the preamble, you'll see that the government has been, it, it, the settlement is restricted to those schools that were essentially run by the federal government. Mm -hmm. I think the three words they used were fund, managed, and controlled. Right. So that's why you have this difference between the schools that are in, mm -hmm. Schedule K as they're referred to, and those that are out. Mm -hmm. So that the class action that we are commencing now, in some fashion, or maybe class actions, looks at the schools that didn't meet all three of those criteria may right. have only met one or two of them, may have only been funded and managed but not controlled or, or funded and controlled, some combination. Totally. Yeah. So all of the institutions, and I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'd be surprised if there isn't more than what has already been identified right. by the undo uh, Unvalidated School Society. We don't know who ran those schools. We don't know necessarily who funded them. And so part of our research is to determine why they were precluded from this settlement mm -hmm. and determine whether they should properly have been included in which we will be looking for some sort of appendage to this settlement or mm -hmm. separately funded by churches, provinces, mm -hmm. First Nations band, private institutions. In Labrador, in the residential school settlement there, for example, uh, there was the Moravian Church that was never part of the national settlement um, right. and something called the International Grenfell Association 
that previously I, like most Canadians outside of Newfoundland and Labrador, had mm -hmm. never heard of. And, and it wasn't yeah. a religious institution, it was a charitable organization. But these were all, these, all, all of these organizations and institutions existed because of the federal government's policy. So this, you know, I'd put this to, be, to, to Minister Bennett, uh, and we'll get to a clip of her, um, that, something that she had said. I don't know, should we go for, how much time do we have before we have a break? Do we want to go to a caller? Do we want to go to a caller? Do we want to go to Ms. Bennett's clip? Okay, let's go to Ms. Bennett's clip. She was here uh, last month with a four minister panel. Uh, and we were asking her, you know, you only half of the people, are, only half of the school story um, are being compensated by this settlement package. So we wanted to know what about the people who were left off that list? Here's what she had to say. There's some forward movement on uh, Indian Day School um, uh, compensation. Uh, your government has said there's 700 schools that will, uh, people, survivors of those schools will be compensated for. There's another 680 schools that were excluded from this. What do you say to the people who say you guys are only half, help, helping half of the victims of, of day schools? So we're very pleased, and of course, being here in Winnipeg, we can't help but think of Gary McLean and his mm -hmm. amazing smile <laughs> yeah. and who sort of led this process. Um, who of the people who came together and decided they didn't want to go to court, they wanted to sit down with the federal government and, and determine what was fair. Mm -hmm. And so that, of that group, I think we, we've done well and we're, we're um, I think, breaking new ground in mm -hmm. terms of the way we can work together. Uh, um, but that's uh, only half of the day school survivors. So I think that the, the issue is that, that we are committed to to do the right thing, to have justice for anyone who was harmed by these failed federal policies in the past. So there is something for those other survivors so, of the you know, I think that we're, schools? We've been working very hard with the Eel La Crosse. Uh, that was a, um, a, a day school that was mainly for Métis. It was run by the province, but we actually have Saskatchewan. But we actually are, are working with the, those survivors to, to, to see what they need and how we can move forward on that, hopefully with the province of Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. But again, each of, each of the schools has a different story, but you know, we started um, with the first apology the Prime Minister gave was for Anderson for a school that was founded before Newfoundland and Labrador were even in Canada. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think our track record is about doing the right thing and that we're going to keep working with all survivors and families to, to get this done. So there's hope for those 680 other schools well, that the conversation think, will continue. I think that we are like the, we're 99 percent through the Indian residential schools uh, settlement and we're going to just keep working on anybody who was harmed. Yeah. Okay, we have to take a quick break. We've got lots of callers. We're going to get to you guys, so hang tight on the line. When we come back, more information about how uh, day school survivors can be compensated. If you're experiencing trauma related to your day school or residential school experience, while you're watching this, please call somebody at the 24-hour crisis line. It's toll-free, 1-866-925-4419. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We'll have more on the day school settlements agreements after the break, so stay with us. Join our conversation now. Call in toll free at 1 877 647 2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at APTN.ca. I want to uh, direct you, if you have any questions about the claim form or the process for day school survivors, call 1-888-221-2898 or visit. We've put together a very comprehensive website to help you, aptnnews.ca slash dayschools. It's got tons of resources and information to direct you where you need to go to be compensated. Okay, let's go now to social media with our social media editor, Jesse Andrushko, to hear what some of you are saying about the day school settlement. Thanks, Melissa. We posted a poll asking, is there enough information on the day school settlement to understand how to get involved? 23% voted yes, 77% voted no. We also want to know your thoughts on the day school compensation process. Here's what you had to say. Dean said, 
Too much paperwork, too much trauma, too much denial, just too much to go through again. Eggie said, I for one only applied for the level one because it was too much to go through all the process of writing down all the abuse. Maybe that's, maybe that's what they're counting on. From Steve, Government courts don't want to quantify or don't know how to measure the harm it has done to generations. I wonder who is going to judge the applications. Ovide said, it's part of the genocide of residential schools era. And lastly from Grant, it's like going back to school. Filling out the applications is just like homework. Such a lengthy process. If you'd like to add your opinion to our topic of conversation, here's how. Join our conversation now. Call in toll free at 1-877-647-2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus, And send your thoughts to infocus at APTN.ca. Welcome back. I'm here with Steve Cooper, the lawyer who's working on a class action lawsuit for day school students who are not included in the federal government compensation package, and our very own award-winning APTN journalist, Kathleen Martins, who has extensively covered both residential school survivors and now this day survivor or day school survivor issue. Uh, and they're here to help all of us make sense of all what's all this happening, lots of moving parts. Um, I just wanted, we've got a bunch of callers, we're going to go to you right away. I just wanted to uh, get started here. I have one question um, from Brenda. This is from our, our Facebook feed. She said, where do we get our school documents that document the date that we attended? Anybody know? Oh, my. It really depends on when, uh, when she attended, uh, where the school was. Um, a lot of the records themselves have been destroyed or archived. The problem, Do you have to prove that? Like, is there? Well, not necessarily. The way that they've set the, uh, th this process up is very similar to what we did in Labrador, which is the presumption that you're telling the truth. Right. You have to swear to the accuracy of the information, mm. and only in the exceptional circumstances and the more serious circumstances are you expected to document anything. So what I recommend that people do until the process determines that this is bad information, submit. Okay. Write down what happened to you the years, the, the, uh, the, the institutions, the people involved. Submit that after you've sworn before a notary public or there's a list of people that can take the oath, okay. um, including chiefs of, uh, and council of, of uh, First Nations bands, for an example. Submit it. One of three things is going to happen. It's going to be accepted. It's going to be um, sent away for more mm -hmm. information. Or in some instances, it'll be rejected. But if it's a matter of your claim seems to be well-founded and honest, then they're simply going to ask you for more information mm. if there's some doubts. My prediction is that the forms will go in, no documents behind them will be necessary, and the compensation will be awarded. Yeah, okay. like I was going to answer her as well and say the uh, National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, it's um, on the grounds here in Winnipeg at the University of Manitoba, mm -hmm. have a fantastic website with lists of schools, the years they were in operation. Uh, okay. If you go on their website and you punch punch in the name of your school, a lot of that stuff will come up. Even if you can't chairs. quite remember the name, the full name of the school or something. Right. As I said at the beginning of the show, your claimants are presumed to be telling the truth okay. in this process. It's not like the residential school process. But it is like what happened in Labrador, and the reason I come back to that is that we, we processed, the claims administrator processed a thousand claims, and there was an area problem. There was oh, no that, documents recorded, no school records. Okay. I swear that this happened to me on these dates at this school and the compensation check was cut in each and every instance. I'm going to throw again to, we've set up a website here at APTN. If you are wondering if your school is on the, on the list that the federal government has said, we will compensate you if, you're, if you went to these schools, go to aptnnews.ca slash dayschools. We also have on there a list of schools that are not uh, part of that compensation package, and you could be part of a class action lawsuit that we are going to get to. Eventually, this is the one that Steve Cooper, our guest here, uh, is involved in. I want to go now to, we've got a lot of callers here. Daryl, are you on the line? Yes. Oh, fuck. Hey, Daryl, thanks for calling in. Do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I'll call here. No, 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 no. Yeah, I have a couple of questions there. Like, uh, first of all, when I attended that school, the, the Indian Day School, we d I did get, a, like, abused, like, sent in a boiler room for being uh, bad, I guess, or whatever, misbehaving or anything. <coughs> and I had the whole dictionary over my head in front of the whole classroom. 
you know. Mm -hmm. And my mom did go to residential school too, so history re repeated itself in the 80s yeah. with me. Do you know if your school is on the list that's being compensated by the federal government, or do you know if your school is on one of the uh, on the list of left out schools? Well, yeah, yeah, we are. So I'm in the process of filling that form out too. Okay, well, uh, good. Indian Day School Class Action Settlement. Okay, well, good luck, and I hope that the process is easy for you. So I'm going to throw actually somebody. No, let's take this opportunity to talk about the, if you're not on the federal government's list, you are on one of the other 680 schools that aren't on that list, what can they do? Uh, I guess phone a simple you. answer. Phone me. <laughs> phone me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. Because um, you've yeah. started, tell, I mean, because not maybe everybody doesn't know about the class action suit that has right. been started by the, uh, the left out. There, there's an organization called the Unvalidated School Society that was formed mm -hmm. in Manitoba and, and with whom I met uh, just in uh, late December uh, before the break. And we're working with them to look at the list of schools that were precluded, that were mm -hmm. excluded from, from the settlement, and try to determine what, in fact, was the basis for that. Mm -hmm. So we're developing class actions uh, based on those schools. Okay. If you are not on mm -hmm. the list of day schools in the settlement, please phone me. Okay. And the reason for that is we're collecting information. We want to make sure that the next round is as inclusive as possible. We're never going to get everybody, I expect, but we're going to do our best to try to ensure that we have everybody. We've got a website that we have set up, uh, aptnnews.ca slash day schools. On that website we've got information that you can go to. It'll tell you whether you are on a list of schools that are good, that's set to be compensated by the federal government or if you're not on that list check out the other list of schools that are excluded and that's the list that you can contact Steve Cooper uh, to get involved in that class action suit. Again that website aptnnews.ca slash day schools. Um, I just wanted to br bring up too, we had a caller in the first block, Tyson, talking about band, um, you know, what can, what can communities do that are being overwhelmed by people coming forward to, to do, help with these claims. You had said that these can be notarized by, um, you know, band councils and stuff. So a lot of communities are going to be getting this flood of people saying, help me, I don't know where this is, not just sign off on it, but you know, presumably they'll have some questions and need direction too. Um, we saw, Kathleen, you saw this story today too. This is from um, CBC News reporting out of Atlantic Canada. First Nations chiefs in the Atlantic region are asking the federal government for emergency help to deal with requests for legal and mental health support from former day school students submitting claims to this settlement process. They say that they've been run ragged, that's a quote in the story, helping former students navigate the legal terminology and detail that is required for these forms. In Atlantic Canada alone, this is according to the CBC story, 7,560 people this involves. I mean, this is, this is going to be overwhelming for a lot of communities. How many people are we talking went to probably day schools? Uh, up to 140,000. It's going to be more than we're in residential school. And um, uh, you've got some, you wanted to mention dates. It's very important yeah. when people are looking to determine whether their particular school or institution is included in the settlement, please pay very close attention to the dates okay. for which the settlement applies. Different schools, different provinces and territories, uh, even two schools that might theoretically have been across the street from each other may have had a change in control or funding at some point. So for example, oh. the school that I went to in Nunavut, in, and I'm going to date myself here, in, in, in 1972, the period for which the settlement applies is only 1971. So I would hate, it would be a real okay. tragedy for somebody to go through the entire process. The school is there, but they missed by a couple of years. So if in fact the institution is covered, but the, the years that you attended are not, you are now, notwithstanding that your school is on that list, not covered by the settlement, and you need to give my office a call. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, t when you get your form in your hand, just just fill out a few things. Don't sit down and try to do it all at one time. Okay. Right? That's right. good so advice. The, the, the advice that, that we give uh, clients and have for the 30 years I've been working on residential school claims is, as you say, Kathleen, do what you can. It's, it's not homework in the sense that it has to be done all in one night. 
there isn't a, a, a pending deadline. The deadline is not until July 13th, 2022. That's important. Again, July 13th, 2022, you have the, from now until then to get your... Do not miss that deadline, but kay. take your time. Okay. Make sure that you're in a safe, supportive environment. If you find that it's causing you trauma, stop. Put it away, someplace safe. Yes. Okay. Um, and then when you're feeling up to it again, mm -hmm. bring it out again and work on it a little bit more. So it's a project, not so much a home, not yeah. so much homework. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, and try not to be alone. Um, it brings mm -hmm. up a lot of feelings, some mostly bad, but it brings up a lot of emotion. Try not to be by yourself mm -hmm. or call someone after. Go for a walk. Just don't be alone. Melissa, you've mentioned this f this uh, helpline. That was very important during the residential school yeah. settlement. It's a just as important now. Do we have that number again? 1-866-925-4419 if you need support as we're talking about this here today, residential school survivors, day school survivors, that crisis line exists for you. Um, I wanted to say too, you know, and I, I, this is kind of an editorial comment, but it doesn't sound like there's the opportunity for the day school settlements, for the, for the day school survivors to be taken advantage of like we saw in a lot of um, residential school survivor stories after that. Is it, is it structured differently so we don't have the Absolutely. shady people coming in to blood suck from well, survivors? I'm, well, okay, that's a two-part answer. <laughs> um, you don't need to hire a lawyer, okay, the, this, this firm Gowling in Ottawa, they are getting paid $55 million as part of this 800 From the federal some, government, this doesn't come out of your settlement. To look okay. after the legal part of this settlement. So okay. if you've got a legal question, you call their office. You don't have to get a lawyer for anything. You don't hire a lawyer. In, in fact, you, you can't get a lawyer. No form Unless the lawyer either. wants to work for free. <laughs> and, and some will. I mean, certainly give us a call if you have a question. But we, yeah. can't, we can't become your lawyer. The way that it's structured, because of what's happened in the past, mm -hmm. no lawyer can charge fees, no form filler, no person can charge fees against that money being paid. Kay. So the big difference in this case as opposed to the big checks that came in the residential school settlement is the money will go directly to the survivor. Yeah. Okay. And so there's some built-in protection there. That's right. But I've already heard that someone was like in a mall saying, I need help with my form. And someone piped up and said, well, I'll fill it out for you for 20 bucks. Oh, kind God. of unofficial form filling. Uh. Now, that's, you know, if it's someone you trust and you know, and you're like, yeah, let come to my house. We'll do it together. But don't pay. Here's 20. Yeah, well, and if you want to give them 20 bucks for right. their trouble or whatever. But, but I'm not advocating that. I'm just saying we're hearing that that could happen. Or has and happened. technically, that's breaching the, uh, the, the yeah. court order which governs the, uh, the settlement. You know, we're going to take a break. Okay. Hang on. Okay, so we have to take another break, but when we come back, we're going to shift gears to uh, toolkit for new uh, Winnipeggers bridging gaps between immigrant and indigenous populations. Uh, but I want to say that we need to take a moment before we uh, leave the topic of day school survivors to remember the person who brought this uh, to us all, Gary McLean. Uh, we can't forget him. He's the one that got the ball rolling for schools, day school survivors. He launched a suit against Canada that led to the federal settlement for day school survivors that we've been talking about all afternoon. Uh, Gary Leslie McCa McLean was born in 1951, passed away just last year. Uh, he was the lead plaintiff in the case since its inception. He was a, a, a dedicated, fierce advocate for day school survivors, so let's not forget him today. We've got to take a break. Stay with us when we come back. A toolkit designed to help bridge gaps between new Canadians and uh, Indigenous populations. Stay with us. Welcome back. Newcomers moving to Canada are faced with a new way of life, obviously, uh, and part of that is learning the history of First Peoples. A new report and toolkit aims to help them do just that. Here's Brittany Hobson with that story. When Hani Atan Alubidi came to Winnipeg 20 years ago, there were few spaces where newcomers and Indigenous people could come together. This is changing, but more work needs to be done. This prompted the development of a new report looking at ways to promote relationship building between the two communities. The gap that we have identified between those two communities um, it was mainly driven by uh, misconception, misunderstanding, myths and some, some type of racism in certain incidents, certain situations. Alubidi works with the non-profit group Immigration Partnership Winnipeg. 
The group facilitated the report. They found newcomers' ideas of indigenous people can be based off of stereotypes. The report includes recommendations to change this, like creating safe spaces for dialogue and cross-cultural activities. Jenna Wirch was a researcher on the project. She says indigenous people should be involved right from the get-go. Any organization can partner up with a, a newcomer organization and uh, welcome newcomers to uh, to Canada when they come into our territory and we're calling it uh, territory orientation so essentially when they get off the plane uh, we have them welcome welcome them at the airport and um, yeah welcome them to our territory ultimately the organization would like to see the development of an orientation toolkit or a document newcomers are given when they first arrive outlining the histories of indigenous peoples in Canada the newcomer population is increasing in Canada, and so is the indigenous population in Winnipeg and in Manitoba. And, and for that purpose, we need to do something about it. Uh, giving it the blind eye would not solve the problem. The gap will get bigger, uh, and it would lead to negative results. Alubidi says the two groups are alike in more ways Just and can learn an from each other. Family unit is very essential to both communities. Uh, collective uh, and communion way of living, uh, elder respect, uh, knowledge keeping, oral traditions, storytelling, uh, resurgence of culture, and sadly, uh, in most cases, in many of the immigrants' communities, uh, uh, colonialism. For Wirch, the development of this report signifies a new way forward. We all come from villages and so that therefore we should all work together as one village. Brittany Hobson, EPTN National News, Winnipeg. You can access that toolkit, uh, which I'll, well, I'll introduce you to a couple guys, uh, Hani, uh, who we just heard from, and another person who made that toolkit. They came and sat down with me uh, not very long ago. I want you to take a watch of what they had to say and they also can tell you how you can access that toolkit if you need it in your community. So I'm here with Alaraza Aladina and Hani Atan Alubedi. Thank you both for joining us. So let's, before we get into what's in this report, I want to, uh, maybe you can share with our audience who maybe doesn't know the situation involving newcomers in Winnipeg and indigenous people in Winnipeg. If you want to start, Hani, just throw us a little bit about that. Sure, thank you. Um, so this, the current situation between the indigenous community and the, the newcomer one, um, it's really, there is, there's kind of um, uh, a gap that needs to be addressed, needs to be looked after. And that gap mainly based on misconception, misunderstanding, stereotypes, and possibly some type of racism. And, and we needed to look into this uh, phenomenon in a, like a, in a closer look and find out what's going on. And in, instead of us just talking to people individually, we thought we need to investigate this problem. And if there is a problem, how we turn it into a positive tool to bring those two communities together. Mm -hmm. So for that purpose, we, um, we use different methods of engagement. And one of them is employing our uh, research team. And that research team was delved into this kind of gap finding type of work. And, uh, and I think we're excited to talk about our report. But basically, the two communities have so much in common. Right. But also, there's, there are some uh, work that needs to be taken place in order for the gap to disappear. We had this conversation, you've been on the show before. You know, there, it's one thing for indigenous people here to be dealing with yeah. um, the racism uh, and colonialism here. And then it's, to add to that, you have people coming from other countries that instantly pick up on that those stereotypes and those attitudes. So this is your group, it aims to kind of end that. When you come over here, it's like, let's get off to a fresh start. So let's talk uh, about the report. So Alaraza, you uh, started working on this long, a long time ago. Yes, I did. It initially started with a uh, field placement, which was part of my master's program, master's in development practice. Um, during the course of that period, um, I did some literature review on the subject matter, and uh, we had sort of finalized a framework for future research to be done, and initiated that on a voluntary basis. Um, 
And in 2017, we were fortunate to get a grant from the Winnipeg Foundation to actually work on this. And so since then, the process started. Um, and this involved you, so this report is you went out with your team and started interviewing leaders, activists, uh, community members about, okay, how can we help newcomers to Canada interact better with Indigenous populations here in Winnipeg or in Manitoba? That's that it in a nutshell, is that mm -hmm. right? Well, w there were three parts to it. Uh, the first thing that we did was to kind of get an idea as to where are we as a city in terms of relationship building between the two communities. So mm. in that we tried to, we attempted to gather different initiatives that are already happening uh, at various levels, whether they're programs or they're one-time events, mm -hmm. and kind of see what has worked, what has not worked, what are the challenges faced. Uh, we collected stories, experiences, that community members, knowledge keepers, leaders, activists uh, had to say about this. Well, what did they have to say? Where do they see Winnipeg as being on this? Oh, um, well, first of all, I would like to say that there are a lot of commonalities between newcomers and indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. and primarily in three areas. One is in the area of history and the experiences with colonialism and you know oppressive mm -hmm. powers. Uh, the second one is cultural, traditional, communal values. And the third one, the challenges that both communities face in terms of socioeconomics, racism, etc. So there is a lot of ground for commonality. Um, but at the same time, as Hani mentioned, there is a gap. There is social distance. Um, it is visible. Sometimes there are tensions and stereotypes. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we must say that uh, there has been a lot of momentum in relationship building, especially in the past few years, especially with, with the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission and the calls to action. There is awareness. A lot of um, community workers are aware of that and you know, working actively to mm -hmm. change systems. So there is a positive trend and it needs to be continued and emphasized on. Well, and that's what this report is going to do. So this, um, Hani, you would explain, this is sort of a map mm -hmm. to a toolkit that you can implement that it kind of has um, just very, um, here's a step-by-step -step how you do it that can right. be used with newcomers. So you explain to us how this, how this is a map and then how it'll be turned into a toolkit and then who will use the toolkit. Sure. So really, if we go back, if we take a step back and go back to the, the, the word GAB, GAB was existed even for many decades. And when we came as a newcomers and we noticed, you know, we have a role in this reconciliation process, mm -hmm. but we need to know what we're doing. Right. And in order for us to know how we do it or with whom we do it, we need to engage the right people. And by right people, I meant the indigenous people themselves. And for that purpose, we engage specific key partners from the indigenous communities. And we came together to explore the how we do it. We know why we want to do it, for the reasons that we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. But how we do it? Are we going to do it in a patronizing kind of way? Are we going to repeat the same mistakes? Are we going to deliver what needs to be delivered by indigenous people to the rest of the people in Canada with a specific lens on the newcomers? Mm -hmm. And if so, how are we going to do it? And so we engage different type of um, uh, people in this process. Now we have this project that is called Indigenous Orientation Toolkit that consists of many themes. And the initial two themes are land and treaties being suggested or proposed by our indigenous partners to start with. Mm -hmm. But how do we start? And we need to inform ourselves, but also inform the method of delivery, facilitations, and al also making sure that the people who receive it would understand the purpose behind our work. Right. So we needed a map. We need, we need concrete steps to get us there. This is the basis. This report is the basis, the foundation of Let's that see, map. Let's see, can you hold it up for us again? We'll and yeah. this is, we're proudly sharing this with the rest of Winnipeg and hopefully the rest of Canada. And that's where we have. This is a report that highlights these steps that I'm speaking of, mm -hmm. and the the themes that I mentioned. And Ali has highlighted some of the uh, of the aspects of those steps. For on the 29th of January and the 30th of January, we will pilot some of those steps in the form of workshop, delivered to settlement sector staff who 
meet on a daily basis newcomers to Canada. And explain to our audience, what is settlement staff? These are people who... Okay. So the settlement staff basically, they are the front line who receive newcomers to settle in Winnipeg and Manitoba mm -hmm. to deliver basic services such as um, school registration, uh, medical appointments, mm -hmm. uh, bank accounts, and the rest of it, just basic, and right. housing. Those people themselves need orientations about indigenous people. And then if they're equipped with the proper information, out, as outlined here in this report, they would be able to deliver appropriate, accurate, indigenous-based information to the new well, a big thanks to you, our viewers, and our commenters today. I know you probably still have a lot of questions left about um, whether you are part of the federal government day school settlement package, or if you are left out of that, what other options are available to you? Can you take part in a class action lawsuit? We have set up a, a page just for you with all the resources to answer some of these questions and direct you to where you need to go. It's at aptnews.ca slash day schools. Lots of information there. I encourage you to go there right now. For any questions about the claims form or the claims process, if you are un at a, from a school that is included uh, in the list, you should phone 1-888-221-2898. Uh, and that is for if you went to a school that you know is approved. Uh, I want to direct you to, if, there, if you've got questions, go to our Facebook feed. Our, it's on our APTN National News live Facebook page. Uh, you can go there, ask some questions. We'll try to help you out there. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Thanks so much for tuning in and have a wonderful afternoon. We'll see you back here next week.